Welcome to FSI Sec's podcast, FinCyber Today. I'm Elizabeth Heathfield, Chief Communications Officer here at FSI Sec. Our guest today is Jenny Mena, Vice President for Threat Management and Response at Health Insurer Humana. Jenny also serves on our Board of Directors. In previous roles, she was Deputy CISO for U.S. Bank and also worked at the Department of Homeland Security for many years in a number of roles. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. So let's start by just telling telling me a little bit about your story and your path to where you where you are now. Sure. Um, you know, I just got back from a vacation, and it's funny. I was thinking about this question last night because I always plan vacations out very well, um, down to the latest, the last detail. And I didn't really have a plan for my career journey. Um, when I started out, I have degrees in Russian civilization and international relations, and I. Um, So my first job was in international development consulting, and I got assigned to a project building a system to have land titling in Russia after the the fall of the the Soviet Union to help them build a capitalist economy. And I worked there for about a year and a half, did not like doing international development consulting, um, and moved over to a company that was more, you know, doing pure IT work and worked on a number of system development and integration projects. And... You know, a lot of those were for the federal government, and they became increasingly focused and starting to think about, gee, we should protect the data, whether it's Social Security information, taxpayer data. And so security became a part of those efforts. Um, And as, you know, I moved around in the company from originally the health systems group to the the new Homeland Security group after 9-11, I started working on a contract for Department of Homeland Security. And from there, um, the customer approached me, asked me to become a federal employee, spent nine years at Department of Homeland Security leading all sorts of efforts from um, a a lot of the public-private information sharing, threat intelligence work, Hmm. but I ran U.S. CERT at one point, I had exercises, I had, I think, just about every job at one point when I was at Department of Homeland Security, went from there to U.S. Bank where I had also a a large variety of jobs. Um, I was the deputy CISO and then moved over to Humana, um, I guess almost two years ago. It seemed like when I was approached by a headhunter um, in the middle of COVID that maybe moving back into the healthcare space was the right time. Mm. Um, And so I've been at Humana ever since and we're both an insurer. Um, which is how we're still part of the FSI SAC, but also a healthcare provider. Oh, that's great. It's funny that you say that because I also studied international development and decided <laughs> to become a journalist instead of going to development after I saw the development at work. Um, I studied in Africa, so <laughs> don't don't come across too many people who studied international development and end up in cybersecurity. So you've worked in a couple of different sectors. So um, what differences do you see in the threat landscape, um, especially between the financial sector and the healthcare sector? I think they're both similarities and differences. Um, And I think any company, whatever industry you're in, because the financial sector is so broad, you can be anything from a credit union to an international investment bank. And so the threat to those companies is dramatically different in the same way that a threat against a drug company in the healthcare sector that has a lot of intellectual property and has an international footprint is going to be very different from a community hospital. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at our, you know, each business really needs to think about what is it that I have that would be of interest to a bad guy? whether that's a nation state. So if you think about things like intellectual property, um, you know, again, that you might have at at a drug company, um, if you do work with the government, if you're doing work in certain parts of the world, as they say, you know, if you're interested in China, China is interested in you. Um, So what is the footprint of your company? Um, Who might be interested in, you know, intellectual property of various kinds? And then also, what do you have that could be monetized? And so that's really easy in a bank, right? Money, Um, but credit card numbers and so on. But then also, what do you have in health, something like healthcare, where you have to worry about things like um, personal health information, which again, could potentially be monetized. We also have to have things like credit card information. 
Um, but then what would the value be as we've seen the rise of ransomware? Mm -hmm. Not so much just to exfiltrate information, but to, you know, threaten you. What if we shut you down? What if we, you know, expose that you've been compromised? What would that do to your reputation? And so each company is going to be a little bit different. Um, and you really have to think about what it is that you have and what are the different impacts. You know, what are your regulatory requirements and what would happen to your company? Um, you really have to be kind of creative and thinking about all those different bad guys out there. Are you in a, a space where your company does something that's controversial and you'd have to worry about hacktivists? Yeah. You mentioned China. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about it a lot right now. Um, I think everybody's watching it right now. What do you think the... How is the insurance sector looking at this, if it is, looking at this current situation with China and Taiwan and, and preparing in any kind of way? Is it any different than just what every company is looking at? I don't think so. Now, again, insurance means a lot of different things. Right. So, you know, providing Medicare coverage um, is, is very different from other kinds of insurance, again, that might be more in an international space and, and different kinds of coverage. So we might have a very different perspective than, say, AIG as a different kind of insurance company. Um, you know, we think about the geopolitical landscape. We think about the potential, you know, you think about Russia. So Russia tends to do cyber attacks within their sphere, sphere of influence, right? So they're attacking Ukraine and they would use cyber attacks to support that. What we've seen happen with them in the past, we saw this with not patches, there was an attack that was targeted to do one thing, but unfortunately it spreads. Mm. Um, and so while you know we are not doing business in, in Russia or, or Taiwan, um, you always do have to have an ear to the ground of, of what's going on because there is that potential um, that, you know, some sort of targeted malware can suddenly find its place well beyond its intended target. Right. So what are the what are the key threats and kind of high level issues that you're focused on now? Um, you know, two of the biggest ones are ransomware, which it's funny, a, a few years ago, there were some predictions by some of the um, kind of industry groups and the studies that come out saying they thought ransomware was going to decline. And I didn't believe it then. And I, it was obviously a pretty good prediction because it continues to, it mutates, yeah. um, it evolves just like any good business would. The ransomware gangs continue to tweak and change everything from their techniques of how they attack um, to kind of the focus. So is it going to be lockup or is it going to be this extortion concept of, okay, we're going to name and shame you, uh, you know, and then attack you that way rather than locking up ability to, you know, stealing data and locking it up. So things continue to change and evolve in that space. And I don't think it's going to go away because it's been successful and continues to be successful. Right. Yeah. So again, we have to, we're dealing with what are, what operate like businesses. And so we have to assume they're going to continue to iterate and evolve and have R and D and, meet the the challenges that they face in their market as we become more secure. So I think that's going to continue and something we're very focused on. Um, there's been, as you know, I'm sure, um, lots of ransomware interest in both the healthcare delivery and the insurance spheres. And so actually one area where we've seen consistency, um, you know, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, we were seeing ransomware DDoS for a while. And this is one, an example of where information sharing across types of companies within sectors, but also across sectors is really helpful because first the, the group that was doing that went after kind of traditional financial institutions, then they moved into insurance, um, both healthcare and other types of insurance. And so we were able to watch that, see what worked. So they went after some of the large financial institutions first and were able to take some really good lessons learned about what the most effective mitigations were mm -hmm. and bring them over to the other side. Um, you know, the other thing that we continue to look at is the concept of the insider threat. And, you know, whether it's, you know, we have people working from home, it's a much different work world than it used to be, where we're used to having everybody kind of in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. 
um, lots of movement between companies and jobs. And we also, um, you know, have seen some of these criminal gangs and nation states approaching employees to help with an insider aspect of gaining that access and foothold and, you know, offering significant financial incentive to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we also need to be really sensitive to. Um, and I would also say it's both the malicious insider and the unintentional insider right. that you know, we've seen over time, whether it's somebody who's not paying attention and is clicking on emails or is trying to do their job more effectively, but circumvents processes that are in place to protect security. You know, we continue to see those things over time. How do you, I would imagine then, like most other institutions, you have to focus a lot on employee education and awareness. Mm -hmm. How do you form a strategy around that? Um, so it needs to be, obviously everybody does their annual training, but it needs to be something that continues over time. So as we continue to see different kinds of attack techniques, updating the fish tests that we send out, you know, and the training that goes along with them if you're a clicker, uh, sending out messages to different parts of the company when we know, for example, that there's a, say there's a ransomware actor group that is targeting legal departments pretending to be from a, a well-known law firm, you know, directly reaching out to the people so that it's not generic, but hey, watch out for this. This is the kind of thing that is being targeted specifically to people like you um, and what to watch out for. And certainly rewarding people when they make those good decisions when they catch something and report it and say, hey, you know, this doesn't look right. Hey, this message looks funny. Um, you know, so both the, okay, you were bad and you clicked, go to the mandatory training, which mm -hmm. is a little bit of a stick because um, no one loves to do additional training, but also the carrot of, hey, you know, you're, you're one of our cyber heroes for catching and reporting this. On that point about the insider, the malicious insider or the insider who actually does get um, bought off by, by threat actors, you know, it makes sense that that would be something I hadn't thought of it, but it makes sense that that would be something that in this time of the great resignation, people shifting jobs around people working from home, that that would be more of a threat than it potentially used to be. So how do you disincentivize that when you can imagine that the resources of the threat actors pretty substantial and if they really want access and they're going to get you know be able to drop a big payload that they'll pay quite a lot of money for somebody to do that so how do you disincentivize that um well i mean i think incentivizing and disincentivizing i guess can mean different things right so how do you protect against that potential threat i think there's you know there's defense in depth like with anything else um, you know, the, these basic concepts of least privilege, how many companies are really enforcing that and going back regularly? It's so much easier when somebody moves from one job to another within the company that they just take their accesses with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's pretty common to find out that somebody who's, you know, been with a company for 15 years and, you know, they retire or leave and you realize they have access to things for a job they haven't had in, you know, 10 years. So I think that, you know, that concept of least privilege so that you're reducing the impact. Um, if somebody does, whether they're an intentional insider or unintentional, if they give up their credentials accidentally to someone who calls and says they're from IT or, you yeah. know, whatever else. And the next thing you know, they've, you know, they become that unintentional insider. Um, you want to you want to limit that. Obviously, different kinds of behavioral analytics and monitoring. Well, that seems strange. You know, why why is that happening at this time? Why is this happening at this volume? And I think that the education aspect as well. Um, again, there are so many unintentional insiders that fall for um, you know fraudsters. Again, calling, emailing, very convincing, very persistent. And another issue, and you know, we've read about this, um, I read about this actually in a couple of studies, is that there are groups of people who think that information is their intellectual property versus company property. 
And two, it's interesting, two of the groups that were at the top of that list in one of the studies were IT professionals who think that code is their IP, um, or some do, right? And another one is researchers. So you have to think about, all right, again, what do we have? What does our population look like? And have we even had conversations about this is company property versus this is your property? And that's not necessarily malicious. Um, it's, a, you know, kind of a difference in understanding. But I think having those conversations and getting everybody on the same page. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's like a philosophical. Um, I want to talk a little bit about resilience and business continuity. It's something mm -hmm. we obviously are thinking more and more about and something that we're hearing more and more about from, you know, in the news, but also from regulators. Do you see cybersecurity, like from where you sit um, at Humana, see cybersecurity and business continuity, um, these disciplines that once were quite far apart, are they converging? And, and if so, how, how are they actually converging? Um, so it's, I think there are a couple different ways to look about that, look at it. Um, and I think initially, how were you viewing kind of the, con the operations continuity and business continuity? And we work extremely closely with the, the NOC, right? The Network Operations Center, because often you don't know if something is a security incident or just an IT problem mm -hmm. at the beginning. Um, you know, if you have an outage, you don't know the cause and something that you think is a security incident may turn out to be, you know, somebody flipped a wrong switch unintentionally or, um, you know, a, a patch gone bad or a, an update gone bad. Or you may have something that you think is just a, you know, run of the mill outage that turns out to have a security implication. And I think in particular, if you're looking into the possibility of insider, you may not know at first. Mm. Um, so I think those teams have to work incredibly closely together, and we certainly do that here and, and in previous places that I've worked. In terms of business continuity and resilience, I actually just got off a call before this one thinking about the hurricane that's coming up that might hit all of Florida, some of Florida, Georgia, Alabama, we don't know, right? So having those conversations about, you know, we have security dependencies, you know, on, on people, on services, on vendors that are in regions that are, are impacted by those kind of traditional business resilience events. Mm. And knowing up front who is where um, in terms of critical vendors that you rely on for different functions within the company and having a plan in place to make sure that, you know, the services that we rely on to secure the business are going to be up and running. Um, again, both people that are associates within the company, but also the, you know, the vendors of all different kinds, making sure, you know, in advance and you're tracking that and you have a plan, I think is, is critical all across and having exercises, you know, between the two groups, I think is also something that I, I you know, certainly in, I think all of the places that I've had leadership roles, um, you know, the, once a crisis reaches a certain level, it transcends the piece where it started and moves into a broader, you know, kind of CRO managing committee or managing team CEO board escalation. Um, and so it's critical to have those partnerships in place and a consistent way of reporting up. How do you, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you, do you, are there like joint committees or how do you actually form the relationships that are required to make sure that you can coordinate and work together when the time comes? Um, you know, I, again, I think in, in most organizations where I've worked, there have been different kinds of committees that address, you know, whether it's risk organizations, enterprise risk or operational risk that spans different pieces, uh, you know, in the private sector side. But I also think doing exercises, thinking about, okay, these are things that could happen, how would we work together? I think that's an important part of a mature security program, but also enterprise resilience program. And how do you bring those things together regularly? Mm. With the with, uh, exercises, I assume you use threat intelligence to inform the scenarios or how do you, mm -hmm. yeah. So 
Can you talk a little bit about how threat intelligence, um, you know, informs your exercise scenarios, but also other kind of strategic parts of security that's not just, you know, IOCs that you're just trying to block, you know, the, the, the broader uses of threat intel that you use? Sure. Well, again, they, you know, if you're going to have an exercise, you want to have a credible scenario because everybody is going to argue with you if you have something that's totally outlandish. Um, so it helps you focus on what really matters. It helps you, you, you know, you can't mitigate against every single risk at the same level um, and, and stay in business because you'd spend, and you can't buy every single security product that if you've ever walked the, the floor at RSA, right, you, there's no way anyone would have enough money to buy everything from all of the vendors. So what is most important, you know, getting back to what is, my, what is it about my company, my agency that puts us at risk and then overlaying what we know from a threat intelligence perspective, you can use that, you know, we use that to prioritize our investments, and again, because you can't buy everything. So one way to look at it is, you know, what is the, is there an actual business tie in? Mm. Um, where do we stand against our peers in, in the industry? What are the compliance requirements that we have to meet? Um, because sometimes depending on the industry that you're in, that trumps everything else <laughs> in terms of prioritizing. And then what, what are the threats that we think are most likely? And, you know, those are best informed by having a variety of different kinds of intelligence providers. How have you evolved or adapted your approach to board engagement over the last couple of years as cyber has become sort of elevated as the critical business risk as opposed to what, you know, used to be seen more as a back office cost? Well, I think, it, you know, in the financial industry, you know, as they say, why do, why do I rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Um, the, the financial industry got the message pretty quickly that, and it's easy to translate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how much do you lose if X amount of money is gone? Right. Um, and so it was, by the time I entered the financial industry, gosh, eight, nine years ago, they kind of had already gotten the message that this was a big deal. Um, and I think, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, as cyber attacks have moved to other industries and we've seen, you know, front page news attacks of everything from hospitals that have to shut down emergency rooms to major ransomware incidents all over the press, you know, people definitely have gotten the message that this is a, a business issue and it's gotten, I think, easier to tell the story of, you know, again, as you're weighing risk and investment of what might the impacts be, because there are more examples that right. you can give um, rather than just trying to guess. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that's been interesting is we see more um, boards having cybersecurity experts added to the board it's actually in some ways become more challenging. Um, I know when, when I was at the bank, I had a, a former colleague who's a CISO from a large household name company in another industry call me at night. He's somebody I'd worked with at Homeland Security on a number of things. And he said, uh, Jenny, do you know Richard Davis, who was the CEO of US Bank at the time? Um, and he had joined this company board. He was highly passionate and engaged in cybersecurity and walked in there where I think it had been kind of a cakewalk for the CISO and the CIO to talk about the issues for your and just pummeled them with incisive, detailed questions um, about what they were doing in their posture and why their posture was different from what he was used to at a large financial institution. Huh. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it's, it's interesting. You have to play both sides because there are very different kinds of people on the board. And so you need to be ready to tell a business story, um, you know, again, unless you're, you know, at CrowdStrike or a company that makes its money doing cybersecurity work, the, the business doesn't exist for cybersecurity, it exists for whatever your business is. And so how do you tie together, you know, what would it mean for the company without this, the sky is falling chicken little, which I do think there was a period where sometimes cyber practitioners went a little too far um, with some of the sky is falling on cyber. So how do you tell a, a reasonable, reasoned story about your cybersecurity risk and how it impacts the business 
that the folks on the board who aren't there for their IT or cybersecurity acumen can understand, while at the same time being ready to pivot when somebody who is very focused and interested comes in. Um, and some of that is we're seeing more committees that are are focused on the area. But I think that's been an interesting change for some people over the years. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you, I mean, is there an, I think that there's, I've heard that there's an opportunity now for more CISOs to actually be on corporate boards, but then for the CISOs whose boards they're on, that actually could be a, a good thing and a bad yeah. thing. They get it, but maybe they get quite a lot of it and they're also inevitably coming from a different scenario. So they may be you know, applying their own experience rather than the experience of the, of the company. That's interesting, I hadn't, hadn't thought of that. Um, do you see that most CISOs that you are, um, that you talk to, and obviously as a board member you're engaged with an FSI SAC, do they come from having that sort of native understanding of how to tell a business story, or do they have to learn how to do that? Because I think a lot of CISOs come from pretty technical backgrounds. So how do they make that leap or that bridge if they don't have the front side of the business background to be able to kind of think in financial terms? Well, I think CISOs do come from a wide, wide variety of backgrounds. Um, and so I think if you're coming in from a very technical background and haven't had a lot of that experience, having a, a mentor to help you with that, whether it's the, the CRO in a company or someone from another company, um, again, I know in some of the financial institutions, we've shared with each other some of the techniques and metrics and ways to communicate to the board between institutions, um, which can be helpful. I know, you know, when I came from government and I actually started doing board briefings while I was in government mm -hmm. um, to support some, some CISOs and making that business case and they helped train me on how to talk to, you know, one, what resonates in private sector versus at, in federal government, but what level and, and what kind of information they're looking for. And I, that's something that kind of continuously, and again, because the landscape changes and the board member changes, so who are you actually talking to? Who's on the board? What is their experience and expectation? What other boards are they on? You know, there are great resources out there, um, the National Association of Corporate Directors, has cybersecurity guidance um, for boards. And I think it's smart to be aware of what they're being told on the board training side, um, you know, or again, what they may be hearing on other boards because so many board members sit on multiple boards of directors that keeping aware of what those things, um, you know, what NACD, for example, is providing a guidance can be helpful. But I think like in anything else, asking for guidance and advice Talk a little bit about your public sector versus private sector experience, especially in cyber. Um, one thing that I spoke about with Teresa, and she's um, been talking about a lot, Teresa Walsh, our global head of intelligence, um, is the idea that she also came from the public sector, that the public sector has a very long history of taking intelligence and turning it into policy, right? That's what they do, national intelligence estimates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, whereas in the private sector, it's not as mature, it's younger. And so there isn't um, the same expertise at taking raw intelligence and then turning it into something that they can actually use to guide a strategy. Do you see it? Do you see that that way or do you see it that way? Um, and, and also, you know, how have you seen the interaction between the public and private sectors evolve over the last couple of years um, regarding cybersecurity issues? Sure. I mean, you know, I think we are not really collectors of raw intelligence in most companies. Um, you know, certainly we have information about attacks that we're seeing directly on us. You know, we might know that we were the victim of a phishing campaign, but in general, we are getting intelligence from commercial providers, frankly, more than, than from government that are 
produced and packaged very much in the same way that the kind of reports that you get as a government official making policy decisions. Mm. So yes, obviously there's lots of raw intelligence data at places like NSA, but that goes through multiple, again, steps of packaging and, and review before it comes to, to folks in, in senior leadership positions to make decisions. So the, you know, the market for what you can get from the private sector and intelligence has really matured in light years um, over the past decade or so. And you know, some of that is because you have people that have come out of government in some of the most senior positions that are then able to use their different kinds of you know, less rules and less, in some cases, may perhaps even greater access to inform kinds of information to produce those products. Mm. In terms of the public-private information sharing, it's, you know, honestly, it's been kind of two steps forward, two steps back. The government has, I think, so from a private sector to private sector sharing perspective, I think we've seen continued maturity and advancement over time. So the FSISAC, one of the first, really phenomenal sharing between members. And when I say, you know, share everything, even incredibly sensitive information right away, um, with each other is incredibly mature and beneficial. In other industries, um, you know, I've also seen real progress of other ISACs coming along. So there was a while where the FS ISAC was kind of the only, you know, game in town, time. certainly the defense industrial base maturing. Um, but I'm really impressed with where the healthcare industry has, has gone. Um, you know, the health ISAC has really matured in the, in the sharing and the services that they provide, um, in you know the exercises they develop for the sector, um, you know, in, in convening communities and experts at conferences, so we're starting to see other industries move forward as well, which is incredibly helpful. Um, but in terms of government, you know, it's you have a lot of turnover in the staff. You have political administrations that come and go with different priorities. We really lost a lot of the progress um, that we had made during the previous administration because of a number of political appointees in the, or two administrations ago in the previous administration where cybersecurity wasn't a focus. There was a feeling that, you know, the government shouldn't be doing things for private sector, um, even though obviously we don't have things like our own private sector signal intelligence capability, um, you know, that government has. So now it's kind of, okay, let's get back at it. Okay, so let's um, thank you so much. It's really interesting and insightful. Um, let's talk a little bit about some advice that you might give to younger professionals who are up and coming or just entering the, the field. What kind of skills should they be building now for the future where you see the future of the field going? Um, I would say, and I say this as someone who went to college and graduate school when cybersecurity wasn't a field. That you want to learn good analytical skills. You want to learn the ability to think creatively, to connect different data points and turn that into information that's useful. Um, you want to learn how to communicate verbally and in writing. So you want to really build those soft skills as well. And I think you need to build resilience for change and flexibility to a, a mindset that you need to continuously be able to learn and do new things. Because I am certain that, you know, in frankly, given the, the pace of change in five, 10, 15, 20 years, the careers and the skills for those careers are going to be significantly different than they are right now, right? That you're probably going to want a job in 10 years that doesn't exist today. And so the, the best way to prepare for that is, again, to just have some of those basic capabilities and then be willing to continuously try new things and pick up the tactical skills along the way. Um, you know, whether it's learning a, you know, some, getting a very vendor specific area of expertise, or I, I finally went and got my CCSP, my certified cloud security professional exam certificate this year, right? I mean, you just wanna stay on top of things at whatever your level is in the organization. 
Um, but you need to be ready to, to pivot. I think we learned, you know, you got to be able to learn to work from home. You've got to be able to learn to work in a cloud versus an on-prem environment, um, you know, rapidly changing international environments, regulatory environments. You've got to be, be flexible and future-proof yourself. Yeah. Interesting to me that you said that you need to be able to write <laughs> and communicate clearly. It's not a not a skill I would necessarily think that many uh, cybersecurity analysts think they need. Well, it depends where you want to go, right? If you want to be a cybersecurity, you know, if you want to work in the the SOC for the rest of your days, that's that's fine. Or you know, you want to be a your goal is to be an awesome pen tester. Um, but even for jobs like that, you need to be able to write reports. You need to be able to communicate. You need to request and advocate for budget. Um, you know, and not everybody is going to be CISO going to a board, but if you, and I, most people I've run into uh, aspire to move up within their field, whether it's as a leader of people or, a, you know, a thought leader, a subject matter expert. And both of those, again, require your, the ability to communicate your point, um, to be able to advocate for resources, focus, attention, um, that requires talking to other people or writing to other people or both. In terms of where you see the threat landscape and emerging risks going, what what is the thing that you're, what keeps you up at night? What are you sort of really looking at and being like, we've got to make sure that we, that we can, you know, future proof ourselves to handle this. You know, I, I should probably be talking about quantum computing or 5G or one of the other hot buzzwords or, you know, that everyone's talking about. But the reality is what keeps me up at night is that I have missed something basic that allows, a, you know, a cyber incident to happen. And the reality is, you know, gosh, it's been close to 15 years that I've been going out and talking to companies or people within my company about cybersecurity. And I could use the same deck that I used when I first started in cybersecurity at DHS because people still aren't patching, right? And so the adversaries are still exploiting known vulnerabilities. People are still clicking on email links. I, you know, all of those basic, people still aren't practicing least privilege, right? All of those basic hygiene measures as we call them, are still, but it's not the, you know, super impressive advanced persistent threat. It's, you know, people don't have to bring their A game. They don't have to bring the next crazy thing because the same old stuff works. Building on Jenny's insights, we'll leave you with a quote by the world's first CISO, Steve Katz. Cybersecurity is a tool for managing business risk. It is not an end in itself. If you like this podcast and want to hear from more FinCyber leaders around the world, subscribe to FinCyber Today on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also find them, as well as articles by other thought leaders, at fsisec.com slash insights, and also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks so much for listening.